Synchronicity refers to two or more events that seem to be related, simultaneously occurring at the same time. And our guest today has had multiple strange synchronicities happen in his life. Are these events merely coincidental, or is there something larger at play? Decide for yourself as we interview one of the original paranormal podcasters, Jim Harold. Today on Homespun Haints. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Haints. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And we hope you guys are doing well on this cold February day. (laughs) The Ides of February. Here they come. (laughs) Today on the show, we have the Jim Harold. You may have learned about us on his show. Well, he's going to be joining us today to talk about some of his own personal stories, as well as kind of a greatest hits overview of some of the things that he's heard on his show. And some of these are going to make you scratch your head. They are so bizarre. Some of the stories that he has heard over the years. So cool. You're going to love this. I think some of these beat your portal mirror stories, Diana. My portal stories? Mm. I hope so. Somebody (laughs) better have something more interesting happen to them. Because that, honestly, that wasn't that interesting to me. Oh, geez. Oh, I only time traveled through my mirror portal. It's just teleportation. Yeah. Well, anyway, if if you're not familiar with those stories, go back and listen to our back catalog. We include snippets (laughs) of Diana's adventures with her garage sale mirror find. But we are going to have Jim Harold on. And if you're not familiar with Jim Harold, he is the host of so many podcasts. He's been podcasting in the paranormal podcast space since 2005. His original podcast, The Paranormal Podcast, is what he got started with. He's also the host of Jim Farrell's Campfire, which includes stories kind of like what we have, but a lot of stories in each episode. It's great to listen to. He's also the host of Jim Harold's Crime Scene. His daughter just started Unpleasant Dreams, another podcast, and he does another podcast with his wife. You won't believe what happened to me. So these are great podcasts to check out. And there's other things he's involved with, too. You can go to jimherald.com and learn all about them. One thing that was really cool that we found very intriguing about one of Jim's stories, and this was just a little side mention on one of his stories that he was on a paranormal cruise, which we find very intriguing. And Diana and I are actually going to put out a bonus episode on Thursday of what we think the ideal paranormal cruise would entail. So if you're looking at a project to invest in, you want to listen (laughs) out for that. I mean, it's totally unrealistic. We will be your first clients should you meet all of our requirements. (laughs) <laughs> Nobody could meet the requirements we have. I, oh. so. I really don't think so. You'll see. It's, You'll it's see. really bizarre. It's very bizarre. <laughs> but speaking of deep sea and ocean, I just learned about this creature. <gasps> Is it a cephalopod? Are jellyfish cephalopods? No, but they're kind of similar. They're, I mean, they're close. They've got big heads and, and dangly bits and, and amorphous blob-like non-skeletal. They're non-skeletal. Stuff. So, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, okay. sure. Jellyfish. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so anyway, have you heard of the giant phantom jelly? The Stygiomedusa gigantia. They all have Medusa in the name. So that's that's like a special fact about jellyfish that most people don't get to realize but a lot of them are called medusa something something oh i didn't know that well it's a stygio medusa gigantia (laughs) i'm guessing it's big it is big it's not the (laughs) biggest jellyfish in the world isn't that a man of war uh no actually no no the biggest jellyfish in the world is the lion's mane Ooh, that sounds pretty it's actually the longest animal in the world it's longer than a blue whale it's longer than a whale it can grow up to 36.5 meters in length (sighs) these are body parts that don't even have like independent movement per se so to give you what that is in feet that is almost 120 feet your bedroom is probably 10 feet long. So that's like 12 yeah. times the size of your, yeah, of your that's bedroom. that's like wraps all the way around my house at least once. That's huge. Oh, my God. So that's the lion's mane jellyfish. I thought lion's mane was a mushroom. So right. I learned something new. So the giant phantom jelly this is not even the largest jellyfish in the world. <laughs> but it is amazing. 
It was first spotted in 1899. And then it just shows up like maybe once a year, once every few years, somebody sees one. I love those sneaky sea creatures. Yeah, they're very rare. And they're like bulbous body thing, you know, the bell. It's about three, three and a half feet long. So it's not that big. But their arms, <laughs> they're like mouths, <laughs> their oral arms, as they're technically called, because their arms are mouths. How does that work? What? <laughs> they, if I remember 10th grade biology off the top of my head, little like filaments that cause the little bits of food to move up, 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 up the jellyfish legs which are not legs, but, you know, up to the whatever the urogenital pore <laughs> that is also its mouth. <laughs> Jellyfish have one hole <laughs> where things go in and out. Well, they call them oral arms. Cool. And they're okay. ruffled. They're really pretty. And those can get up to about 33 feet long. Damn! Uh-huh. So that's still like three times the length of your bedroom. <laughs> that's an amazing feat. What does it do with these oral arms? What does it eat? Do you know? They th- think it eats plankton and small fish but you know they're not sure because it's kind of (laughs) because it's only sighted once a year it likes to hang out in the midnight zone this is why it's called phantom jelly yeah i love that so you have to go really really deep twenty-two thousand feet deep to see this thing there is a beautiful video on YouTube that the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute put out that I will include on our Facebook page. But this is an amazing creature. And I'm so glad that you know so much about jellyfish, Diana, because I don't. Yeah, I, I took 10th grade biology. Do you well, know I did one too, of the things, but... <laughs> did, you, did you learn about nidocysts? What? No. Nidocysts with a C. Nidocysts are the cell adaptations on the, the stingy bit stingy dangly bit it's a single cell of the tentacle that when you stimulate it so usually brushing against it is enough to stimulate it it actually has a little hair like projection that shoots out instantaneously projects out of the cell into you and that's how they inject their poison it's an automatic thing so jellyfish don't actually hate you they just, they, <laughs> it, it kind of happens by itself oops nidocysts are one of the most fascinating cell modifications in the entire animal kingdom as far as i'm concerned again things i didn't know anything about i was just like oh there's these bulbous jelly things in the ocean you got to stay away from and if they get you you got to pee on your leg yeah i don't know if peeing on your leg helps but probably getting like rinsing would help maybe peeing helps I, no I really no i don't know if that's a myth it is a myth you tried it no maybe you have to get somebody else to pee on you no, you're not into that? Okay, that's no, fine. No, We don't have to talk about that on this channel. It's not that kind of a... <laughs> vinegar. You're supposed to use vinegar. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Pea and vinegar are both acidic, so that's probably what's going on with that. Okay. So you okay. were talking about nidocyst things? The nidocyst is like the part of the cell, which is called a, a nidocyte. Mm. That's not as fun a word to say. <laughs> but the, the nidocyte is just a single cell in the tentacle it specifically like contains the nidocyst which is just it's a cell part it's an organelle like a mitochondrion yeah exactly but basically the only thing inside of a nidocyte is a nidocyst pretty much and just ejects from the nidocyte i i don't know how to explain this i'm not a biology teacher it's cool it has to do with like water pressure change and this little coiled nidocyst inside the nidocyte just like When the water pressure changes, it suddenly shoots out and becomes like a stinger, kind of like a bee stinger, but it's not a solid. It's more of like a a piece of the inside of a cell, almost like the flagella on the end of a sperm. Similar. So sperm don't inject you with toxins, but other than that, or do they? They don't. Anyway, that's also different podcast. No, stop. (laughs) That us. Not that kind of blog. No pee, no sperm. (laughs) Why do we keep talking about this? Well, this giant phantom jelly recently made news because oh. it was spotted off the coast of California. Again. Again. Is it like spotted by people who were on land or spotted by divers? By divers. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> you never know. Sometimes these weirdos are like, you know, 25,000 feet under the sea is kind of deep for today. I feel like surfacing. You never know. There are octopi that do that, weirdly. These things, according to the Monterey Bay aquarium they are everywhere 
they are everywhere. They're not like one particular part of the ocean. You're going to find them anywhere you go, except for the Arctic Ocean. I guess it's a little too cold there. But they have been spotted off the coast of Antarctica. So who knows? These things are crazy beautiful. And we just have to know more about mouth arms. Painted loves, are any of you biologists that know what a mouth arm is in reference to a cnidarian? Because we really want to know. Apparently, oral arms do contain the cnidosis. Oh, okay. So it's a dual purpose tentacle-ish mm-hmm. appendage. I think some jellyfish, they, they differentiate between the stingers and the feeders. So these oral arms, you, f- you find them on the large jellyfish. Okay. And this is also how they have sex. They do this through their mouths. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Not that kind of blog. Sorry. <laughs> you don't shoot sperm out of your mouth, though. Thank la- God. La- oh, my goodness. You have so many children. Um <laughs> So these arms are useful for a lot of things. Apparently. I want to have mouth arms. Sounds awesome. 33 foot long mouth arms. You know, it brings a whole new meaning to I'll have what she's having. You just reach over with your mouth and taste her food that you don't even have to like get up out of the table. Mm -hmm. Just reach out 35 feet. Mm, Mm. Delicious. Mm -hmm. I impregnated your food while I was at it. Surprise. (laughs) Well, Diana, this was uh, really bizarre. Are you done talking about this? Because I'm still fascinated by jellyfish sex. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Well, if you find any good pictures, be sure to share them on our Facebook group. (laughs) Facebook.com slash group slash homespun (laughs) hates. Where we post photos of jellyfish gonads and more. We'll also probably have that on our Instagram at homespun hates. Oh, God, I hope so. Oh, Diana, we have a patron to give a shout out to. We have a new patron. Mel from iGhost Mio is now our patron. Yes, thanks so much, Mel. If you aren't familiar with iGhost Mio, it's Mel's podcast. She shares stories of the paranormal nature from the Caribbean, Latin America, and her own heritage as a Cuban American. Like Becky, she travels with no fewer than three tarot decks in her bag. (laughs) Everywhere she goes. So thank you so much, Mel. We're so happy to have you as a part of our Patreon. Thank you, Mel. If you would also like to join our Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash homespun hates. That's where we actually get into the discussions about gross stuff. You thought it was bad today. Just wait. (laughs) Now that we've talked a lot about jellyfish, their various sperm-like appendages and sperm-like actions and functions and they're 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 bigger than whaleness and bigger than my bedroomness let's talk to jim <laughs> let's bring on jim after these messages Today on the show, we are thrilled to bring on Jim Harold, the Jim Harold. You have probably heard of him. He is the OG paranormal podcaster, host of the Paranormal Podcast, Jim Harold's Campfire, and he has recently rebooted Crime Scene, which is a true crime podcast. Jim, we have always been inspired by what you do, especially with your Campfire Tales. You do so many other projects as well, which can all be found at jimherald.com. Thank you so much for being with us on the show today. Thank you, guys. So good to be with you. I really appreciate it. And thanks for coming on the Campfire Show. I know you shared a couple of great stories there. Just glad to be here with your audience and you guys today to talk about some spooky stuff. Yes, absolutely. Well, before we launch into some stories that you have, we'll be hearing about here in a little bit. Tell us about how you got started The Paranormal Podcast was the first one you began back in 2005, I believe. Yeah, 2005. Yeah, I started podcasting as a hobby for fun because I was a frustrated broadcaster. I worked in media, but I worked on the ad side. I'd gone to school to be in front of the mic or in front of the camera. Thought I'd start a podcast in 2005 when I first heard about it and wanted to do something I was genuinely interested in. And one of the things I'm very much interested in, and I always have been since I was a little kid watching Leonard Nimoy and In Search Of, was the paranormal. So I thought I'd start it, and never with any thought that it would be my full-time job. Never. Never even entered my mind thought it'd be a neat hobby. And it's worked out relatively well. And Jim Harold's Campfire, how long has that been? I started that in 2009. And that was another thing. You know, it's funny how, like, because that's my most popular show. I didn't have a guest that particular week. And I said, well, you know what? Wouldn't it be neat to hear people's true stories of the supernatural? I'll just do that. And the reaction was so good. I'm like, 
duh, this is a whole nother show. <laughs> so that's how we started that particular show in 2009. With the Paranormal Podcast, it's not just ghosts. No, 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 no. UFOs, cryptids, near-death experiences, the afterlife, Ouija boards, tarot. I mean, we've kind of covered it all on there because to me, the paranormal doesn't mean just ghosts. And even Campfire, honestly, we get a lot of stories about ghosts, but we also get a lot of stories that are about what I call head scratchers, things that happen that don't quite make sense, like the woman who was rescued by a mechanic at a gas station. She had broken down. And a couple days later, she brought her family over. She wanted to show them the place where the guy had rescued her. And the the place looked totally boarded up, like it hadn't been open for like 15 years. Those are head scratchers. Mm -hmm. So we have a wide range of stories, a lot of ghost stories, a lot of shadow people stories, and those kind of things, of course. But we've had like every kind of story you could think of almost since we started back in 09. But there's always something new. And that's something I love about it. And I saw on the Paranormal podcast, you just interviewed Claire Goodchild. Yeah, she was great. The Book of Seances. And she talked about different kind of divination, because we tend to think of we start with tarot cards and end at a Ouija board and we don't think about anything in between. And she talked about things like automatic writing and bibliomancy and those kind of things. And that's what we do on Paranormal podcast. We talk with authors and experts, I'll put in air quotes here, because the thing is, is that I think there are people who are experts on the research of the paranormal and very smart, but I don't know that anybody knows 100% what's going on. That's not to disrespect any of the great people we've had on the show over the years, but uh, it's a tough thing to get a handle on, because as soon as you think you got figured out, it moves, it shifts, it changes. (laughs) We would love to hear some things that have happened to you over the years. I always feel like, oh, I don't have a good one because I do not have the traditional. I'm, you guys have great haunting stories and I don't have those. But I have had stories where weird synchronicities have happened. And one of my favorite is about my uncle. My uncle was like a second dad to me, literally like a second dad. And he passed in 2013. So anyway, I was on a paranormal cruise in 2017 with the late, great Rosemary Ellen Guiley, who was awesome. Read her books, Micah Hanks and and people like that. And I was going to speak. So I went to get something at the cafe, some coffee or something to warm up the old pipes. So I had to walk through the casino to get to the like little conference area they had. So there's this guy playing this claw machine with the claw that comes down and drops down and picks up. At the stores, it's like stuffed toys. Here it was money. And my uncle used to go crazy for those machines. He would like drop 10 bucks to win like a 99 cent little stupid stuffed toy and then hand it to some kid. And I said, oh, gosh, I wish he were here. He would love it because first it's got the claw game. Then it's a little bit of gambling because he was the kind of guy like to play the scratch off tickets and that kind of stuff. Nothing big, but that little kind of stuff. I said, he would love this. I wish he were here. I thought to myself. No sooner I had that thought than a woman walks next to the machine, cups her hand to her mouth and goes, John, John, that's my uncle's name. And then within a few minutes, a guy walks up next to her, must have been her significant other. But the point I have is that it's not like seeing a full body apparition. But to me, what that was, was a signal from the universe or from my uncle or for God or whatever you want to say that he knew I was thinking of him and he was acknowledging, I see you, I see you, I'm still watching out for you. And a funny little note to that is like I inherited a bunch of tools from him and I'm I'm kind of mediocrely handy. I'm like a little handy. So anyway, I got a bunch of tools from him. So like I'll be looking for sockets and stuff. And, you know, if you've ever had the experience, you can't find the right one and things. I'll go, John, help me find the right socket here. And in about 30 seconds, I'll find the right one. So I like to think that we've got that line of communication going. To me, sometimes, particularly when it comes with these loved one situations, there are signs, but sometimes they're subtle. And I know people say, well, that's just wishful thinking and so forth. But boy, that was a heck of a coincidence of all the names that woman could have said. It could have been Steve. It could have been Bill. It could have been Jim. It could have been Louie, whatever, you know. It was John. I just thought that was almost too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. You mentioned that you think there may be a line of communication between you and your uncle. 
yeah. that's helping these synchronicities. Do you think it could be the reverse? Do you think there might be a way that you are manifesting somehow that connection? You are manifesting, finding the bolts and stuff? Maybe, maybe. And that's the thing about this whole topic that I find interesting because people will say, well, you've been doing this for 18 years, so you must have the answers. And I say, hell no, I don't have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I only have more questions than I did when I start. But the one thing I will say is I believe that our reality is far stranger than anything we understand. And I'm utterly convinced of that. And I, I think one day, hopefully, the answers will be given and we'll know and we'll be gone. That's what was going on. Are there other what you would describe as paranormal experiences in your own life that you would like to share? They're all like weird coincidental things. Back in the 90s, when I was dating my wife before we got married, and we'd only been dating four or five months or something like that, not very long. We went to an amusement park some people may have heard of called Cedar Point. It's like mm -hmm. pretty much the top coaster park in the United States or pretty close to it. It's about, I don't know, an hour and a half from where I was living. We got some free tickets to the park for the day with some friends, and I went to take my wife back home. But at that particular time, she lived about 40 minutes from where I lived. And she was living with her parents because she was in grad school and she's very young. I took her back home. She said, do not get in that car and go home. She said, because I'm telling you, you're going to wreck, you're going to fall asleep because we had to go an hour and a half. And then we got to go another 40 minutes. I was exhausted. She said, let me ask my dad if you can sleep on the couch. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't really know these people. I don't want to be that way. Sure enough, I say, OK, I'll give something told me, you know, she's probably right. I'll give in. So I did that. And we got up in the morning. I slept on the couch and got up in the morning. We all had breakfast. It was very nice. Very nice. And then I drove back home and I live kind of in it was an inner city area, but it was it was still a decent neighborhood. It wasn't great, but it was still considered decent. And it was an old style A-frame house. It kind of looked like the house in A Christmas Story, that kind of style house, a really old house. I had the front half and the landlord's son had the back half. I had just coincidentally earlier that week signed the lease to move to a new apartment out by who would become my fiance and then my wife. So anyway... The landlords, I pull up and I'm like, la, 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 I'm in a good mood, da, 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 da. And he, he's standing out in front of the house and he's pointing and talking to one of the neighbors. And I'm like, hey, Dave, what's up? He's like, we've got to talk. And I'm like, yeah, sure, what's up? And he's like, oh, there's been a drive-by. And I'm like, where's there been a drive-by? Our house. AK-47. Several <laughs> rounds of armor-piercing bullets. I've got pictures and a piece of shrapnel to prove it. Took out my new microwave because I was recently out of college, so this was like my first real apartment myself. Took out my new microwave. Took out my old-school avocado gold double-door refrigerator. Went in one side, went through a ketchup bottle, and out the other side. Oh, my goodness. <gasps> Actually... The poor landlord's son was there, and there were, like, bullets whizzing over his head. What happened was, is we lived in a dark blue house. And the next house next to us was white, a light blue. And under the amber-colored streetlights at 3 o'clock in the morning, when the motorcycle gang decided to do the hit, they hit the wrong house. Yeah. So, again, could that be a coincidence? Absolutely, it could be a coincidence. Or could have been a saving hand. Or was it my wife putting a hit on me? No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the point being that some people would say, hey, Jim, you just got lucky. You just won the lottery of life. And other people would say it wasn't meant for you to be there. And I think it wasn't meant for me to be there. So those are the kind of things that tend to happen to me. I, I haven't, at least that I know, and somebody made this point. I said, I've never seen a ghost. And they said, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, yeah. So if there's been similar stories like that, do you have more that you'd like to share? I'll give you another synchronicity story. And this one's kind of poignant. My uh, brother died in his 20s, very young, in 1999. 
he was autistic. And there were certain that he had very disparate musical tastes. He liked everything from he used to watch the old TV show. Some people out there might remember Soul Train. Then he would like classic country music. And then he would like Lawrence Welk. I don't know if you guys know who Lawrence Welk is, but uh, it's champagne music. And that was still on <laughs> public broadcasting when we were kids or whatever. He was pretty non-communicative, but he would write things out that he would like. And he would always write Lawrence Welk and hand it to you and telling you to put the television on Lawrence Welk. He would do that with other shows. But that was his number one favorite. For some reason, he was enamored with Lawrence Welk. He tragically passed away in his 20s. We were coming back home from his funeral, and this was before Spotify or anything, so a lot of times you would just listen to the radio. And me and my wife were coming up from West Virginia, from where my family was at. We're coming back, and I'm flipping through the stations, and there's an instrumental playing. And I'm like, gosh, that's familiar, but I don't know who that is, who's playing that instrumental, what group that is. And it was like old school music. And then the DJ comes on the back announce and says, of course, that was the big 1960 hit for Lawrence Welk and his orchestra, Calcutta. Lawrence Welk, even back then, you weren't hearing Lawrence Welk on the radio regularly in 2000, 1999. And I just happened to be in that geographic area because you remember how radio stations used to be in when you they go in, they go out, they go in, they go out. So I had to be on the right time, on the right station, with the right song, which was like his one major hit, I guess, that would have gotten radio play. So I just felt like that was some kind of a sign for my and my wife. And this is before podcasting existed. My wife looks at me and says, that's your brother. So there you have it. So it sounds like she might be connected, your wife. Has... Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I got one more story. And this one is probably creepier than any story that I've told you. And this really is a head scratcher. So what happened was, is that this is in 2001, shortly before 9-11. My mother-in-law was very, very sick. In fact, they started in-home hospice. But it was kind of a scenario where we felt, you know, she probably has a month, two months left. Nothing that we thought was going to happen within days. And so that particular night, my oldest daughter was a couple of years old. She was young. I stayed with her, and my wife was with my mother-in-law. They lived only about 10 or 15 minutes away. So anyway, that evening, my wife wanted to stay longer, but my mother-in-law encouraged her to leave. She said, look, you've got a little girl, you've got a husband, why don't you go home? And my wife's like, no, 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 Jim's got taken care of No, you go home. You need to be with them. So anyway, she goes home. So rest of the evening is normal. She talks to her on the phone. Everything's fine. We go to bed about 3.30 in the morning. She wakes up and looks over my shoulder and sees a vision of Mary, Mother Mary. Oh. And she's like, why in the world am I seeing that? And she said it was different than any picture you would see. She was beautiful, but it was very different. So anyway, that happens. She goes back to sleep. A few minutes later, there's a phone call from her dad. And her dad said, she's gone. My wife said, who's gone? What are, what, are you, what are you talking about? She's gone. Who's gone? Your mother's gone. She died. Turns out that Mother Mary was like a big thing for my mother-in-law. When she was married, she brought the statue of Mary at the church, roses and all this stuff. Like that has been like her spiritual touchstone through her whole life. And to have that weird thing happen. And this, again, is before Jim was podcasting. Before any of that. And and that happened, and that's a story that we told before we ever thought of doing a podcast or anything, before it existed. So, I mean, it's these little, little things that make you say, yeah, there's something going on. You mentioned earlier that there was a story of a woman who had been rescued at a gas station and then later found out the gas station had been closed for 15 years. And you've had several time slip stories like that on your show. Do you have any similar stories like that that you'd like to share that you've heard from guests? Well, another one that I think of is one that happened to a young woman. She recounted this about when she was a kid and they used to play in the... In fact, I think it might have been in Atlanta, in like the suburbs of Atlanta. And you know how kids will get to 
together and like I think they lived in development, but back behind the development, there are woods and stuff and you go exploring and stuff. So anyway, this one day they're walking in the woods and they come to this clearing and there's like this old stone house and there's this little kid in knee pants. He looks like he's in a costume from like either the late 1800s, early 1900s. And his mom is there and she kind of pulls him away and she's in similar kind of clothing. The boy absolutely saw them and they saw the boy. It was like, you know, when you see somebody and you look at him and you know they see you too. So anyway, they thought, man, that was just weird. So a few days, you know, kids, hey, we're going to check that place out. We're going to go over there today. So they go out and they're exploring and they go to the clearing and there's some stone. There's basically a foundation where a house was. No current house. And I've heard multiple stories like that, and I really do believe, and that goes back to that whole thing I said about the nature of reality. Even scientists increasingly are saying that time is a construct and it's far more complex than we understand, and it's not what we think of as time. So I wonder if sometimes, I hate to use this phrase because it's so overused, but I'm going to use it anyway, a glitch in the matrix where sometimes we we see stuff that we shouldn't see. Have you noticed that there's an increase in these sort of, I'm using the word time slip because I don't know a better word for it, but we've talked to people who have noticed an increase in these instances in areas where a lot of trauma has taken place, specifically battlegrounds or hospitals or things like that. Have you heard that as well? I've heard in general that there's more paranormal activity and hauntings and those kind of things. As it pertains to time slips, I don't remember specifically hearing that, but it would make sense. It does make sense if these places have more energy and there's more going on on that kind of energetic plane that something like that would happen. It would actually make a lot of sense. What comes to mind when you say that specifically So this was Lloyd Auerbach. I don't know if you talked to Lloyd, but he is awesome. He's a parapsychologist, very serious about this stuff, and has been doing it a long, long time. So he was doing a segment for the old TV show Sightings in the 90s, and they were looking at a case where there had been a murder. People would go to that location, and they would literally see almost like a replay of the murder. So they would see the murderer and the murderee doing the deed, killing the person. That would be weird enough. You'd say, oh, what a weird haunting that was. But there was a twist. Of course, the victim was dead, but the murderer was very much alive and in prison. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I guess my point is, is that it's a situation where you would traditionally assume when I told that story, you probably assume the murderer was dead and you would assume it was a traditional ghost story, but was really more of a time slip, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, that is creepy. Yeah. And then somebody called in and told this story. A guy said, I was a little boy and I was walking through the hall of my house and I see this hooded figure in the kitchen making a sandwich. Okay. That's weird enough. And then he said, a few years later, I'm a teenager. I'm in the kitchen minding my own business, making a sandwich. And I look in the hall and there's like this little boy that runs and runs away real quick. He basically saw himself. So is that a ghost story? Is that a is that a time slip? What is that? <laughs> That's nice. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I guess what I'm thinking is, is we always go right to dead people. And I think that is part of the explanation. I think that can happen. And I'm one who believes in both residual hauntings and sentient haunting. But then there are other explanations, too, for some of this stuff that we see that may not be dead people at all. It may be more of a time slip kind of situation. Oh, one more, one more. (laughs) This is probably on the top 10 of my campfire stories. And we just played this one for Christmas. So a gentleman sounded like he was in his late teens, early 20s. He and his family, um, they would rent a big house and around the holidays, all of them would come together. So you'd have four or five families staying together. So being one of the older ones, he would sleep wherever he could, like on the couch or whatever, because the young kids would get the rooms and stuff. So anyway, this is Christmas Eve, and I think it's him and his brother. They're sleeping on the couches in the living room, and he wakes up. He's looking, and there's what looks like a figure kind of haltingly going down the steps in a tuxedo, kind of herky-jerky motion, 
which I've heard before with ghosts. And the ghost or whatever it is in the tuxedo kind of looks around and like looks like, oh, it's good to be back. Kind of like that kind of look and says, oh, my love, what a mirror image we are. And then it disappears. Mm. Uh, what is that? <laughs> right? What is that? Oh, my love. And in that herky, jerky motion is something I've heard multiple times. And the idea, going back, and the reason I told this one, time slip, it almost sounds like maybe someone who lived there. Because I got the sense this was kind of a fancy house. So he's coming down this grand staircase in his tuxedo. And maybe it was Christmas time, 1921, that he was originally coming down. In his tuxedo. Who knows? Maybe kind of a little bit of the shining kind of thing going on. Do you get the indication that the man in the tuxedo saw the present day people? No, I don't think so. No, it was just like they were kind of zoned in on their own world. The saying, I mean, how enigmatic is that? Right. My love, what a mirror image we are. What does that mean? Is it a mirror image across time? What's the significance of that? I don't know. Speaking of mirrors, that's another thing that I know is a theme in some of the stories that you've had on your show. And Diana herself, she's also had some portal mirror experiences of her own. Maybe time slips, maybe portals. Can't explain it. What sort of things have stood out to you about people's stories regarding mirrors, specifically antique mirrors, mirrors that maybe shouldn't be accessed or have something spooky attached to them? One of my all-time favorite mirror stories is about a haunted mirror. There was a gentleman, his name's Michael, he's out in L.A., and he went to an estate sale. And he looked at some of the stuff and get some things. And then there's like this ornate gold mirror, like old school mirror, leaning against the wall, heavy. And uh, I think if I remember correctly, a person said, I want to give this to you along with the other stuff. Like not even, I don't even think charge it. And he's like, I think you need to have it. And uh, dun, dun, dun. (laughs) And he says, okay. So he takes the mirror. He puts it up in his bedroom. And then weird stuff starts happening. All kinds of strange stuff starts happening. But the strangest is this story. He's sleeping, taking a nap, I think, in his main level. The mirror's upstairs. All of a sudden, he hears what sounds like a bunch of people stomping upstairs and making a lot of noise. So he wakes up, he goes upstairs, and he sees a group of people dancing in his room. And there's one guy who's like, you could tell he's the ringleader, okay? And he looks at Michael and he says... We came with the mirror. (laughs) We like to dance. And that's where you come in. (laughs) And then I think they just disappeared or whatever. But I had him retell this on my YouTube channel because I do a little bit of video. The weird thing about that was is sitting behind him was that mirror. He kept the mirror. And I'm like, what? I would never keep that mirror. Get that thing away from me again. Back to Mr. Chicken. (laughs) <laughs> no way but maybe if he gets rid of the mirror a part of him goes with it that's why i like being safe safe mm. safely behind the mic safely behind the mic we came with the mirror and then he had a whole host of other paranormal stuff that happened in the house what did they mean by that's where you come in don't know maybe the fact that the mirror was brought into the space gave them permission to come out of it and dance i i don't know I would get rid of that mirror so quick. And then years ago, talking about haunted objects, and this has been so long, I don't recall all the specifics. This family had purchased a recliner from like an estate sale or something. And it turned out that somebody who used it had passed away. And then all this crazy stuff started happening. They put it in the one son's bedroom and he started, his behavior started going down. He seemed to be almost like tormented and stuff. And they realized that bad things followed wherever this chair went. So they took it outside to the curb and they claim that they went outside and saw the chair moving itself, like dragging itself down the curb. Yeah. But I do believe in haunted objects. I absolutely do. For example, I have like a pocket knife that belonged to my grandfather who died many, many years ago, decades ago. But when I feel that, I feel like I feel a part of his spirit. Now, that might be psychological. I don't know. But I do believe that especially stuff that you use all the time, 
and you have is in contact with your body or something, something like, honestly, like a microphone. That's something you're constantly putting your essence into and you're talking to and those kind of things, whatever it might be. I think it picks up some kind of weird vibration, and I think that can outlive a person. And it could be positive or it could be negative. I believe that's a real thing. That makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. It's also a warning against buying used audio equipment, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) I've got some microphones for you cheap. (laughs) I think you should take this for free with all the other stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Diana has a haunted mirror, and I keep telling her to get rid of it, and she will not. It's so So. cute. And I got it for a really good deal at an estate sale. (laughs) Jim, thank you so much for sharing so many stories with us, both your own and those of some of your guests and your Collins, that's quite a slew of head scratching. Like yes. you said, a lot to think about. You've been listening to Jim Harold of the Paranormal Podcast, Jim Harold's Campfire, and Crime Scene, as well as several other projects that you can find on his website, jimherald.com. You can listen to all of his podcasts on any platform that you get your podcasts, where you listen to Homespun Haints, go look for the Paranormal Podcast and for... Jim Harold's campfire and crime scene to check those out as well. Jim, thank you so much. This has been such a joy, such a pleasure to talk to you. You're the one that started it all with paranormal podcasting. So, Well, there were people on radio who were doing it way before me, but I'm glad I could do my part and I'm glad to continue doing it. And I'm glad to see people like you guys continuing on with it and, and making it bigger and better all the time. So congratulations on your success and everything that you have forthcoming as well. And as I often say, I don't think I'm done yet. I think I got another 10 or 15 years in me. Absolutely. But I uh, love sharing the podcasting, paranormal podcasting stage with great folks like you. Oh, well, thank you so much. Those were some amazing stories. I can't wait to listen to more episodes. And it sounds like over the next several decades, while we continue this work, if if we follow in the same vein, we're probably just going to, uh, despite all the answers, just end up with more questions. And hopefully for all of our hainted loves, that results in a very spooky day. Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit. <laughs>